Let us pray. All-powerful God, in Jesus Christ you turn death into life and defeat into victory. Increase our faith and trust in him that we may triumph over all evil in the strength of the same Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Yet we are justified by faith through God's grace through the redemption that is ours in Jesus Christ. Trusting in God's mercy, let us confess our sin. God of grace, love, and communion, we confess that we have failed to love you with all our heart, soul, and mind and to love our neighbor as ourselves. We ignore your commandments, stray from your way, and follow other gods. Have mercy on us, forgive our sin, and raise us to new life, that we may serve you faithfully and give honor to your holy name.
Friends, hear the good news. Hope does not disappoint us, for God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit given to us in baptism. Believe this good news and be thankful. In Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. with one another, and if anyone has a complaint against another, forgive each other, just as the Lord has forgiven you. The peace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. And also with you. The readings of Scripture will come from members in their homes. We now ask the Lord to bless the reading and the hearing of God's word. Let us pray. God of mercy, you promise never to break your covenant with us. Amid all the changing words of our generation, speak your eternal word that does not change. Then may we respond to your gracious promises with faithful and obedient lives through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. A reading from the book of Genesis. Hear what the Spirit says to the church. The Lord appeared to Abraham by the oaks of Mamre as he sat in the entrance of his tent in the heat of the day. He looked up and saw three men standing near him. When he saw them, he ran from his tent entrance to meet them and bowed down to the ground. He said, My Lord, if I find favor with you, do not pass by your servant. Let a little water be brought, and wash your feet, and rest yourselves under the tree. Let me bring a little bread, that you may refresh yourselves, and after that you may pass on, since you have come to your servant. So they said, Do as you have said. And Abraham hastened into the tent to Sarah, and said, Make ready, quickly, three measures of choice flour, knead it, and make cakes. Abraham ran to the herd and took a calf, tender and good, and gave it to the servant who hastened to prepare it. Then he took curds and milk and the calf that he had prepared and set it before them, and he stood by them under the tree while they ate. They said to him, Where is your wife Sarah? And he said, There, in the tent. Then one said, I will surely return to you in due season, and your wife Sarah shall have a son. And Sarah was listening at the tent entrance behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were both old, advanced in age. It had ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of women. So Sarah laughed to herself, saying, After I have grown old and my husband is old, shall I have pleasure? The Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh and say, Shall I indeed bear a child now that I am old? Is anything too wonderful for the Lord? At the set time, I shall return to you in due season, and Sarah shall have a son. But Sarah denied, saying, I did not laugh for she was afraid. He said, Oh yes, you did laugh. The Lord dealt with Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did for Sarah as he had promised. Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age, at the time of which God had spoken to him. Abraham gave the name Isaac to his son when Sarah bore him, and Abraham circumcised his son Isaac when he was eight days old, as God had commanded him. Abraham was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born to him. Now Sarah said, God has brought laughter for me. Everyone who hears will laugh with me. And she said, Who would ever have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? 
Yet I have borne him a son in my old age. Holy Wisdom, Holy Word, thanks be to God. Spirit says to the church. Therefore, since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained access to this grace in which we stand. And we boast in our hope of sharing the glory of God. And not only that, but we also boast in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not disappoint us, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. For while we were still weak at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Indeed, rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person someone might actually dare to die. But God proves his love for us in that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. Holy wisdom, holy word, thanks be to God.
Gospel lesson is from the Gospel of Matthew. Hear what the Spirit says to the church. Then Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and curing every disease and every sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Then Jesus summoned his twelve disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to cure every disease and every sickness. These are the names of the 12 apostles. First, Simon, also known as Peter, and his brother, Andrew. James, son of Zebedee, and his brother, John. Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector. James, son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus. Simon, the Canaanian, and Judas Iscariot, the one who betrayed him. These twelve Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Go nowhere among the Gentiles and enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. As you go, proclaim the good news. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Cure the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. You received without payment. Give without payment. Holy wisdom, holy word. People keep telling me that one of the hardest things about living through a pandemic is figuring out what day it is. Boy, I say amen to that. There, there used to be a rhythm to the week that culminated on the Lord's Day, Sunday. Yes, I know, Sunday is supposed to be the first day of the week but it never feels like that to a preacher. For me, the week used to build up to that hour when we gathered as God's people to pray, confess, rejoice, eat, drink, sing, touch, and share. As the psalmist of one, Psalm 122 says, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Now we record hymns and prayers on Wednesday and the sermon on Thursday, usually Thursday, and Friday is for sitting in front of the computer putting it all together, and Saturday is for fixing anything that might have gone wrong, and by the time Sunday rolls around in my head, I'm already into the following week. Thank goodness we have the liturgical calendar to keep us oriented. 
We are now in the season called Ordinary Time, and that will last until November. Ordinary in this context does not mean typical or humdrum. The term comes from the word ordino, meaning related to a series. Think of those series, those binge-worthy TV series some of us have been watching far too late into the night. Each Sunday in ordinary time provides a new episode to the story of the ministry of Jesus. The script writer this year for the series is Matthew. Matthew is clearly the most Jewish of all the four gospel writers. To make matters interesting this morning, we do not begin at the beginning. We are parachuted right into the action as Jesus commissions his 12 disciples to hit the road, just like Paul Revere. They are to bring the good news of God's fast approaching kingdom to every Middlesex village and town. The, the difference is Paul Revere had a horse and the disciples are on foot. If you listen closely, some of that laughter that's echoing from the first reading is bleeding over into the gospel reading today. It's hard to imagine a more unlikely collection of messengers. Look at Matthew's list. First comes Peter, who when push comes to shove, denies that he even knows Jesus. Last on the list is Judas, the betrayer. And in the middle, a few fishermen, common, uneducated, from a profession near the bottom of the social ladder in ancient Palestine. Oh, and let's not forget Matthew, the tax collector, who until very recently has been a collaborator with Rome, and Simon the Zealot who used to be a guerrilla fighter in the insurrection against the oppressor. Hmm. It, it is a motley, if not laughable, crew, and to add to the absurdity, Jesus charges this group to take up the miraculous work he has already been doing, casting out unclean spirits, curing every disease and sickness demonstrating by word and action that with Jesus arrival on the scene God's kingdom is dawning we could ask Sarah who is still wiping tears of laughter from her face which is more amusing a nonagenarian like herself having a baby or a group like this most of whom still reek of fish, casting out unclean spirits, raising the dead, curing every disease. Nothing on the resume of any of these 12 would make you think that they are in any way qualified to fulfill the mission that Jesus has just given them. Perhaps the disciples at this moment are tempted to shelter at home, <laughs> to draw the curtains, to keep the good news to themselves. And if they do feel like doing that, well, I can't say I blame them. Jesus' commission to his first followers, of course, comprises our commission too. You and I are no less called to be agents of healing and restoration, to cast out unclean spirits, to raise the dead, to cleanse the leper, to bring good news. And like those first disciples, we lack the appropriate resume. One of the items missing on our resume, at least for most of us, is this. 
most of us have not experienced the repeated trauma, the constant pressure of being a person of color in this racist culture of ours. I never had to tell my teenage sons to take special care not to provoke the police should they be pulled over for a traffic infraction. There is no written law, you see, uh, no unwritten law about driving while white. I never suffered particular scrutiny while doing shopping in a department store. Security guards didn't take me for a shoplifter just because I had white skin. I was taught by my parents and, of course, by my church to treat everyone with dignity, but I'm sure I formed implicit biases about people of color which endure to this day. Growing up in San Antonio, Texas, my best friend was a boy named Ivan whose family spoke Spanish at home and whose abuela brought us wonderful tamales every Christmas. Ivan and I were tight and I'm grateful for our friendship, but that early experience didn't immunize me from the influence of negative messages about people with brown skin like Ivan. My family moved to South Louisiana when I was almost 13. I knew enough to recoil inwardly at the racist jokes my friends would tell in the locker room. I never challenged, however, the joke teller. The Confederate battle flag was a common sight, even in the land of crawfish and etouffee. There was a stretch of beach on the shore of Lake Charles, Louisiana, where the colored people would congregate. And a few hundred yards along the stretch of beach where white people would congregate. That was the way it was. Nobody said a word. The truth is it's well nigh impossible to grow up white in our culture without being shaped by the narrative that white people are just better, smarter, more cultured than brown people and black people. Even when that narrative is unspoken, even if it's challenged at home and from the pulpit, it is nevertheless pervasive. The past few weeks have exposed the raw truth about our nation. Our culture is racist through and through. No longer can we pretend that our institutions and traditions are colorblind or that everyone gets a fair shake under the law. If you think racism isn't a problem, watch that video of George Floyd begging to be allowed to breathe while the policeman holds his knee on George's neck for almost nine minutes. If you think racism is not a problem, look again at that photo of the president standing in front of St. John's Church, surrounded by powerful white people, including a general dressed in camouflage as the president holds up that Bible. And if you think the Church of Jesus Christ is free of the evil spirit of racism, then I invite you to stand here where I stand every week and Look up at that gallery where enslaved people, brothers and sisters in Christ, were required to sit and look at their masters downstairs. 
ask them, they will tell you a different story. I was in a discussion last week over Zoom, of course. The topic was, what should white Christians do about racism? One of the presenters, an African-American theologian who teaches at the seminary where I attended some years ago, posed this question, is it even possible to be white and Christian? His point was that we in the white church are so blinded by our own privilege that we can't hear the gospel for ourselves or repent of the very evil which we claim to deplore. That professor's question has haunted me all week as the demonstrations and protests continue is it possible to be white and Christian? Then I opened my Bible and I read about those 12 misfits whom Jesus entrusted with the good news. Their names were Peter, Andrew, James, John, Philip, Bartholomew, Thomas, Matthew, the other James, Thaddeus, Simon and Judas. L look at them in Matthew's Gospel. Jesus has chosen them to proclaim good news and not one of them is qualified. Not one of them is worthy. Without grace, beloved, nobody can be a Christian. Without repentance, nobody can proclaim the coming of God's kingdom. Without humility, no one can see the log in one's own eye. Now is the perfect time for you and me to join Isaiah the prophet, who in the presence of the Holy One cried, Woe is me, for I am a person of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. Remember what happened when Isaiah said that? A seraph flew down and touched his lips with the burning coal of God's mercy. And Isaiah became a prophet of the Lord. And remember what happened when those three visitors came to see Abraham and Sarah to tell them that they were about to become parents and everything would be covered by Medicare. Sarah laughed. She said she didn't, but she did. And what did that messenger say to her? Is anything too wonderful? For the Lord? These are scary times, beloved, but they are also wonderful times. That acts of racial hatred and violence are being exposed, that's good news. That leaders and officials are being held accountable, that's good news that the church of Jesus Christ is being called to face its racist past and its racist presence that's scary but that's also good news miracles are happening out there the blind see the lame excuses limp away the dead are raised up to give their testimony to past injustices. The poor are given a voice to tell their story. This is God's doing. It is terrible, 
and it is wonderful in God's sight. You and I can rejoice that God is at work in the world and that flawed and wounded as we are, God still has work for us to do. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us confess the faith of our baptism. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Good morning, everyone. I hope that you are all in the midst of reading our church's first summer book group pick, Rabbit Cake. Our discussion for this book will happen on July 1st at 7 p.m. on Zoom. Email me if you are planning to participate so you can get the Zoom link. This morning, I'm really excited to announce that um, our children and families will be able to participate in something called Compassion Camp during the month of July. This camp will include components of online Bible study as well as crafts, activities, movies, and even cooking ideas to do throughout the week to reinforce the themes of compassion, kindness, love, and what it means to live as a beloved child of God. More information is going out to parents in an email. Remember that Compassion Camp can be done wherever you are. You don't have to be at your house. If you're on vacation, you can still participate in Compassion Camp. So you do have to register to participate so that we can make sure you have all the supplies you need um, to have a great experience. Email me at christy at oldfirstchurch.org to participate in our camp. This evening, the youth group will meet on Zoom at 6 p.m. to discuss our upcoming service opportunity at Second Harvest Food Bank. And don't forget that besides our weekly Sunday morning adult church school class at 845 and children's church school class at 10, we also have a weekly coffee chat it's a Zoom gathering that happens at 11.45 a.m. and everyone's invited to come, catch up, and just see some of your church family um, on Zoom. Let us pray for ourselves and for the world. Oh God, you are like a father who teaches his child to walk, who waits for his beloved to come home who runs to meet the prodigal. O oh God, you are like the mother who gathers her chicks under her wings, who keeps watch through the night, who feeds and comforts her beloved children. Hear these our prayers for ourselves and the world you love, and form us as we pray into your servant's people. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our prayer. We pray for your church throughout the world and in this place. Open our eyes to the evil we deplore but cannot recognize in ourselves. Open our ears to hear the anguish of oppressed neighbors. Help us to face the truth about ourselves and to see how without intending we put our knee on the neck of the dying. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. 
We pray for the leaders of nations, for our president, and for all who hold positions of responsibility. Help them to seek the common good, to heed the cry of the people, and to give more than lip service to the rule of law. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the children of our community and for their families, for parents who must teach their sons how not to become victims of violence, and for children who cannot understand why others judge them by the color of their skin. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And now we thank you, O Lord, for your servant, Heinz, and for all those who have gone ahead of us and who now rest in you. Help us to follow what was good in their example and to look forward to glad reunion in the life to come. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for those who mourn and those who suffer, for those who are ill, for those who long for a cure, and for all who need your help in special ways. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O God, in your loving purpose, answer our prayers and fulfill our hopes. In all things for which we pray, give us the will to seek to bring them about. For the sake of Jesus Christ, amen. Amen. Freely we have received. Let us freely give. Let us make gifts of thanksgiving. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right right to give give our thanks thanks and praise. Holy, holy, holy Lord, we praise you for your love, bringing order out of chaos, breathing life into dust, leading captives to freedom, calling wandering children home, 
giving bread to the hungry, drink to the thirsty, raising the dead to life. We thank you for Jesus, word made flesh, light of the world, living water, way and truth, resurrection and life. Spirit, come and live in us, in your people, one in the body, one in the blood, one with Christ, one in ministry, in this place, in every place, in the world, and in the world to come. Blessing and glory, wisdom and thanksgiving, honor and power, forever and ever be to you, O Lord. Amen. Amen. And now, as Jesus taught, we are bold to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of God's Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and abide with you forever. Amen. Amen.
Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.